Hello, and welcome to Yesterday, Today, and Forever, a virtual ministry of the Churches of Christ. It is our desire to present to the 21st century person the faith of the first century Christians. We seek unity through the acceptance of the faith that was once and for all time delivered unto the saints, a system of faith which first began to be spoken by our Lord prior to his crucifixion and was later confirmed to the saints by the apostles and inspired writers of the New Testament. Thus a faith from yesterday, to today and into forever. Our speaker is Brian Barrett, who preaches for the church at Bear Branch, in Spurlockville, West Virginia. We encourage all persons interested in the faith of our fathers, to open their Bibles, as we search the scriptures, for these eternal truths, which can lead Christians back into unity as the family of God. Now, here is Brian. We're studying this morning from the book of 1 John, chapter 2, and we're going to pick up at verse 15. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 15. John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But we have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. <laughs> Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall continue in the Son and in the Father. We're going to stop there. We may go a little further. We may not make it that far. I don't know. Depends on how things go. As we've been looking in these uh, verses uh, leading up to this point, uh, John has been speaking to those who are in the church, both those who have been in the church for just a small time and to those who have been there for many years. Uh, we all have to be faithful unto death in order to receive the crown of life. And so John's writing this to encourage us to remain faithful to the truth that was uh, once given, uh, preached, proclaimed from the day of Pentecost forward, and that we abide in those things in the commandments, in the teachings, that you know, our goal, of course, is not to sin, uh, to walk in the light, see as the light, have fellowship one with another. In verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. You know, there, there are many who have their roots so deeply planted in this world in the sense of this dirt and earth. They are so set to that and so live uh, by the things of the world 
but they have little time uh, and little desire toward the things of God. Now, it is obvious that we have to live on this planet. It is obvious that there are things that are required in order for us to live in this world. And there are things generally of this world we need. We need the food that is there. We need the air uh, which is there, the water. We, we need all of those kind of things. But on the other hand, the world is filled with sin. And so we, we walk a razor's edge trying to discern the differences between the things that God has given us as a blessing. That is, He makes His Son to rise on the just and the unjust. He makes His rain to fall on the just and the unjust. We have to separate out the, the things that are given to us of God so that we can exist in this world and the various perversions of all of those uh, things which God has given us. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of tricky sometimes. You know, God gave us all things uh, to enjoy, to be a part of, uh, again, from the fact that He created them male and female. He created marriage. He created the family. He, he, he planted the garden. He put man in the garden. Uh, and so there, when we talk about the world, you know, we need to distinguish between the general things of the world that make us uh, and empower us to exist here. The air that we breathe, all of those but then on the other hand, there are things that have been brought into this world and there are things going on in this world that did not come to us from the Father. Sin was introduced into the world. Uh, we were defiled by that sin. And from that time, there has been many worldly things which again, cater to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These things which are not of the Father and take us out of relationship with Him. I am mindful here in verse 15 uh, of what Paul said about one of those who was a partner with him uh, in the work of the church. As he's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, uh, he speaks of, a, of one named Demas. And he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, some theologians try to defend him, much like some try to defend Judas, that he had good reasons. Some say that uh, Demas just went off trying to save the world and preach the gospel. Uh, if that was the case, uh, Paul, I don't think, would have used the word forsaken, abandoned. Uh, you know, if, if he had went as others, he talks about others there who have departed to different places, but for Demas, he specifically says that he had forsaken him having loved this present world. And there are those who start in the church and they continue in the church for a while, but they're kind of divided between the things of God and the things of the world. That great division that Jesus speaks of of God and mammon. You know, where, where is your emphasis? What is important to you? And as John speaks, he says, for all that is in the world, and by that he defines the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we have three distinct areas that he identifies. The lust of the flesh. 
You know, God created us so that we could interact with this world. You know, He uh, created us with the power of sight and of hearing and smelling and tasting. I mean, He wanted us to appreciate all the delights of creation. And we think about all the different plants and all the different foods that exist, and it becomes clear that He intended for us to experience, to enjoy the difference between the apple and the orange, the difference between the watermelon and the cantaloupe, you know, the, the difference between a cucumber and a squash. You know, they're, they're all different. And He intended for us to, to enjoy uh, those aspects, to the, the fact that He gave us the ability to see in color when black and white is good enough. But He gave us the ability to see in color and to hear and to experience uh, and, you know, there, there is an, a certain sense of satisfaction that one should get from a job which is well done. I mean, we're all expecting, hoping that Jesus will say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, that as we think about the things that we have done, uh, in this world, there is a certain amount of satisfaction. Especially as we live a Christian life, we, we try not to be prideful in the sense of, of thinking of ourselves as better than others. But on the same hand, uh, if we have lived better and make better decisions, there should nonetheless be some satisfaction there. Now comes the however. The devil used those things to tempt Mother Eve, and he uses that to tempt us. And even though the forbidden fruit per se is not here any longer, even without that forbidden fruit, there is still many things that can cause us to turn away. And so there is the lust of the flesh, the emotions, the desires, the feelings, the taste, all of these uh, those physical senses that God gave us to interact with this world can also be used to do nothing more than to fulfill the desires of the flesh without any thought to the Spirit. And people become, uh, again, they drown in these lustful ways of the flesh. You know, everything that God has given us, we have to assume He put here for a reason. Uh, and so uh, we should be able to appreciate that, but we ought to also know the limitations. And so uh, when we get into the excess, when we are consumed by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, uh, you know, again, it's one thing to appreciate the beauty that's in the world. But again, at the same time, that can be also turned to lustful ways. Uh, men and women lusting after those who are neither their husbands or their wives, uh, you know, desiring again, looking at things. Uh, you know, again, the, the idea of, of, of lust is covetousness. Covetousness is idolatry. Uh, and so coveting after the things which we see and seeing something that we like and then either going to get it or working hard for the purpose to have something. And, you know, we live in an age now where, you know, uh, want seems to supersede need. Uh, you know, my grandmother, like, Many of your mothers and grandmothers, you know, she used to 
wash our aluminum foil and reuse it if it wasn't too bad. We all know that, you know, she, you know, she made her own drapes. And again, we, there were things that were needed and there were ways to accomplish that. But I was listening to the, the news last night and they were talking about many of the stores. Uh, their shelves are still full because people aren't buying like they usually did because the interest rate on credit cards are up and people have lost their jobs and, and all the various. So these stores are worried that all these people's wants, this, you know, go into the store, we see it, you know, I want it, you know, don't necessarily need it, but I want it. And so that that aspect of seeing and, and wanting and just buying it and, and going after it, they're, they're worried that, you know, that might be somewhat curtailed this year. People may not just see and buy without putting some thought into it. And so part of the lust of the eyes is, is knowing, you know, what should and should not uh, be a part of our lives, what we should desire and not desire, know the difference between the things that we need and that we want the things that are allowed and the things that are not allowed. And so that is all controlled through the Scriptures. And if we look at the uh, old law or we look at the list that we find uh, within the New Testament of various sins, all of that in one aspect or the other is meant to help us to regulate the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, uh, and then if that's not bad enough, once we get it, we've got to prate around with it. You know, we've, we've all got neighbors who don't need to have the trailer hooked to the back of their pickup truck dragging a four-wheeler or a boat through town. I mean, there's a hitch on that thing and you're, you can actually park it. You, you don't have to take it with you everywhere you go. And so, you know, it it's gets to the point like, look, I've got a boat. Look, I've got a four-wheeler. Look what I've got. And, you know, we don't just set it in the yard. We, we drag it around everywhere we go so people can see it too. You know, in the pride of life, look what I've got. You know, look, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. And so John says, you know, these things are not of the Father. They, they are of the world. And we have to be very, very careful uh, while we are in this world that we do not become a part of this world. That we understand that uh, our uh, hope, our desire is in heaven as the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians you know, the third chapter there, if you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above uh, where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. You know, that's, that's where our hope is. And John, in this letter, you know, he sometimes is very short and to the point. And so lest, again, people want to debate things, he, he says these things is not of the Father, but of the world. You know, this, this is not something that is open to debate. You know, it's, this isn't something that, you know, is, is one of those areas that sometimes we think of as liberty. You know, the Bible says to do something or not to do something. You know, that's, that's a command. And so we're obligated to do or not do whatever it says. But there are some areas of liberty. But John says this isn't one of those areas. You know, understand that the lust of the flesh and the fulfilling of those, those desires, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these things are not of the Father, but of the world. And he goes on to say, and the world passeth away. And so do these things eventually. Now, one of two things will happen. Jesus will come again or will die. And as Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, we brought nothing into this world and we're not going to take anything out. You know, that's, uh, that's just the way it is. And so the things of the world pass away one way or the other. Either Jesus will come again, the earth 
uh, will pass away. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The works that are therein shall be burned up. That's what Peter says in uh, 2 Peter the third chapter. Or else, as Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. And so we will uh, nonetheless lose uh, all of this. And, and again... Jesus in Matthew 16 asked that question, for what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And so the, the world passes away and once those things are gone, there's nothing left to lust for. Uh, there's nothing left to desire uh, there's, there's no flesh left to desire those physical things. Uh, and so the body is gone and the things connected to the, this world that took over are gone. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. We look forward to a new body like unto our Lord's glorious body and we look for the opportunity separate and apart from sin uh, to serve God away from the things of this world that that those who uh, have defiled this world the devil and his angels and those who worked with him uh, we cast into that lake of fire which is the second death uh, and so we will be free from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, all uh, that is of the world which has passed away. Any questions or comments down through 17? Now we get into the discussion that, uh, that sometimes consumes the world about the Antichrist. Uh, he refers to to the church as little children. Uh, it is the last time. I mean, we understand that. You know, there was a time in the garden and then there was the time before the flood and there was a time after the flood and there is the time of the law of Moses and the patriarchal age that we think of and and all of that has, has come along, and so there's it seems there's always something after that. But John says it's the last time. You know, we're not looking for anything else uh, to come along that is better than Christianity or anything that's going to improve what we already have. So we accept the fact that it is the last time. We're not looking for another dispensation in this world, we're looking for Jesus to come again. Uh, and so we're waiting for the dead in Christ to rise first. We which are alive and remain to be called up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so they have heard, it has been taught, it has been uh, given to them uh, that Antichrist shall come, that there would be the coming of the uh, Antichrist. Everybody wants to talk about the Antichrist. But notice John says, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Everyone is focused on the Antichrist in the sense of one person who is going to be so much bigger, greater against the things of God. Uh, he is so opposed to the teachings and, and all that we come to know and appreciate. But John says, you know, looking for just one person who is going to cause problems for Christianity is not really the best way to look at things. Because he says to be truthful with you, right now, this very minute, there are many, many antichrists in the world. And that was the time that John was writing. And 
Uh, again, I would say that today there are many antichrists in the world today who oppose the things of Christ. And the word anti means against. And of course, Christ means the anointed, uh, the Messiah, uh, the, the Holy One or anointed one of God. And so anything that opposes uh, that which we have been taught, that which we have been given, that which we should be following, that wants to lead us off into a, another direction, uh, creates the situation where you know we're we're dealing with an antichrist and false teachers, antichrists. Don't look for one great big one. I mean, it's apparent that the devil would be, in the greater scheme of things, the true Antichrist. He is the one who has opposed Jesus all along from Genesis 3 forward, the one who would uh, bruise the serpent's head and would destroy him and him that had the power of, the de of death, which was the devil. But John says the truth is, just as Again, the idea of the or Antichrist. There are many who have opposed the things of Christ, the things of the church. And again, this just proves to us that it is the last time, the last dispensation. Now, notice what he says. They went out from us. These who are now opposing the things of Christ and the things of Christianity, they went out from us, but they were not of us. In the early church, as well as the church today, there are those who were a part of us, and they have obeyed the gospel. They came into the church and they were with us. But this is the point that I make many times. Just because somebody sits in a pew at the worship of the church of Christ does not mean they are of the church of Christ. Just because they have been baptized into Christ does not necessarily mean they are truly of the church of Christ. Because the church of Christ has a very specific doctrine which is specifically laid out in the Scriptures. And what John is telling us here is those who would oppose those teachings, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. You know, let me put it another way. I know what the Bible says, but that's the spirit of the Antichrist. You know, and, and so John points out the fact that, yes, they sat with us. Yes, they were baptized by us. Yes, you know, we assumed that they were our brothers and sisters. When the communion service was held, they partook of the communion service, that symbolism that we are in a common union or we're in a fellowship one with another. And so he says, you know, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They're not the ones who were sent out such as missionaries by the church to preach and teach. Uh, again, for had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. And so there is a break in the fellowship. They have went out from us. You know, I, for whatever reason, I don't agree with that anymore. So again, I'm going to go up the street and I'm going to build me a building and I'm going to teach the things that I want to teach. And John said, this, the very fact is, if they were of us and if they were in fellowship with us 
And if they were concerned with the doctrine of the church, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. And this puts us in an interesting position because we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, is it better that they stay with us? Or is it better that they go up the street and tack another sign on a building and identify themselves separate from us? And ultimately, we know it would be better if they would just stay in the doctrine. But as much as division is bad, the leaving, the going away, the separating is evident that they are not apart. And you know, there, there are many religious organizations today when you mention the Church of Christ, it practically puts them into seizures. And so, uh, I mean, they practically raise a cross and, and treat you as if you're some kind of, of, of unholy thing. And in those cases, it's apparent that they're not of us. And as I drive along and I see the various signs, I know they're not of us. They're not of us. If they were of us, they would have stayed with us. And so in the process of time, what John was seeing there has only multiplied itself into the various fracturing both of the Christian world into what we know today as denominations. And as we're getting the lesson here shortly, uh, also has fractured the church. And so we're, you know, here's that, that question that, that we'll ask again. Is it better that they stay with us and just cause us problems and are constantly uh, arguing and debating? Yes. Uh, this versus uh, church class. Uh, first time the church cries, this before all the sickness started, it would take the cup and hand the cup like they do in the Catholic. Right. And some would be like we died here, as each one has a little cup. Now, which ones are all? That's kind of splitting tires. <laughs> uh, again, you know, I, I don't really. You know, in the greater scheme of things, I don't think the container is the important part. It's it's the fruit of the vine. Jesus said, "Is this cup the fruit of the vine?" Uh, you know, the Lord's. And here's one thing most people don't. When let me let let me just let let me ask you this question: How many people here had Thanksgiving dinner this week? When when okay. When when you set the table, how many cups did you put down on the table? Why? Why would you give everybody a cup? Why? That's, that's, that's the way it is, right? I mean, when you go to a restaurant and the waitress comes by and there's two people at the table, she puts two glasses of water there. Why? Why didn't she just put a glass in the middle with two straws? Because we know that's not the way we do things. And it's not the way we've done things for a very long time. And the night that Jesus was having this meal with His disciples, do you think they were all slurping out of one cup? No. You know, do you actually think that, that Peter was looking at John and saying, man, I need a drink. Let me, have your, let me have the cup. Let me have the cup. You know, if that was the case, we just put a pitcher there and let you drink out of the, the, the pitcher. You know, this, this is where people sometimes miss the whole point. They get all lost in the cup. Jesus picked up His cup and He spoke about the cup, the fruit of the vine, and He asks you to all to drink of it. And, you know, we, we know that they all had their own cup. I mean, nobody sets a table without, you know, you, you, everybody has a plate. Now, we know the utensils vary. 
But generally speaking, whether it's a bowl, whether it's a plate, whatever it is, there's something to put the food in. And there's generally something to drink out of for every person. And that's the way it's been for a very long time. And so, again, when we, we talk about the cup, the fruit of the vine, you know, we shouldn't get lost in the utensils. You know, Jesus said the cup, the fruit of the vine. Now, how we do that, you know, we have the bottle back here in the refrigerator and we can unscrew the cap and we can pass it around. We can do that. But again, honestly, how many people do that? I mean, when you sit down to dinner, do you screw the top off a two liter bottle and set it in the middle and just let everybody pick it up and slurp out of the bottle? We know we don't do that. And so don't, don't get lost. And that's where we're at. People get lost in the utensil. You know, do, do you eat the pass? Here, here's another question. Do, do you eat the Passover lamb with your fork? Alone, or to use the fork and the knife, or is it okay to pick it up with the spoon? Now, I know they probably didn't have all of that. I understand that. But again, don't get lost in the utensils. You know, we're pretty sure the bread was on a plate, and, you know, all of that. So, but there are those who make that a point. And when they make that a point, you know, if you prefer one cup, and everybody in here prefers one cup, and we're all happy with the one cup, there's not a problem. You know, I mean, I, I don't have a problem if that's what everybody wants. If they want one piece of bread on one plate, and they want to break that bread into two pieces and then pass it around on two different plates or whatever. Again, it's not a problem. But what happens is people insist that not only you have the one cup, but you have to use one piece of bread, one loaf. And uh, then these things become doctrine. And then those doctrines become divisions because... You know, in today's vernacular, I'm not a one-cupper. You know, I had uh, again, a preacher contacted me. We had been interacting for a while, um, talking, and uh, he says, you know, he had just converted a, a multi-cup church to a one-cup church. And I just went in and blocked him on the Internet because... And I know what that's where that's heading. He's going to mine everybody that's in there, and he's going to start. That's what he does. You know, his idea of evangelism is to go from church to church to church of the Church of Christ and convince them they're wrong for using multi cups and help them become one cuppers and one loafers, as they call them, uh, and. That's his idea of evangelism. He believes that he's doing a very good work by convincing people that they've been sinning by taking the communion ever since they were a Christian until they started using the one cup. They weren't uh, the type of people God would accept. Yes? Well, speaking of one cup, I wonder what they do in a situation like the pandemic comes about. But they're still they're using still one using cup. One cup. It's like it, uh, eating out of one spoon, one bite, take a bite and bite the spoon around. And I, I worked with a lady, and of course, she got really upset. But how many, I mean, most of the, the, the women and most people who cook in here, when you're cooking, you know, you stick a spoon in there and you, you take a taste of it and see if it's got spices, and you put spices or whatever, you stir it up, you take that spoon again. You know, there, there's some people that, you know, they go, they go completely nuts that the cook might have actually put the spoon to their mouth and then stirred the pot with it. But if you're honest, most of them, that's what they've done. But again, we don't make a whole lot of, of uh, you know,
know, I mean, we don't spend a whole lot of time focusing on that. I never went to a restaurant yet and asked if the chef tasted that meal more than once when he was cooking it, and did he put the spoon back? Anybody ever ask that question? And, and you know, again, some of the chefs and some of the restaurants, they got their own, their own little spoon that they have in their pocket, and they'll go through and, and they'll stick it in there and, and stick it back in their pocket. And, and uh, you know, their little shirt protector thing there, and they got a little thermometer in there, and they'll stick it in that meat, and they'll stick it in this meat. And again, there are certain things that we as common sense understand, but then somebody focuses on one thing, and it becomes an obsession. And when it becomes an obsession, then it becomes a doctrine. And when it becomes a doctrine, it becomes a cause of division. And then once we have the division, we have opened the door, of course, to the denominations and, and all of that. And so, you know, the, the very fact that they're not of us, uh, again, proves that they're not with us, proves that they're uh, not of us. And, uh, you know, we, we need to, uh, as he says here, you have an unction or an anointing uh, from the Holy One, and you know all things. And that is, at that time, somebody there had received, or some there had received through the laying on of the apostles' hands, a, a portion of the Spirit and had the ability to discern things the way that they needed to be, and they knew things. And they know when people are of us, with us, or just passing through uh, along the way. And, uh, and John says we, we need to know, you know the difference. Uh, we, and and that's, that's a hard thing. It, it is. You know, and I, I don't you know, say that just lightly or once over. It, it, it has caused troubles in, in families and, and everything else that um, they divide over these kind of issues. Yeah, and and there are some who that you have to follow that verse in the uh, in Acts the second chapter. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. You have to follow that exactly. You know, you, the worship service has to follow that exactly. You know, the preaching and the prayer and the, the communion and all that stuff has to be done in just the... Or if you don't do it exactly like they did it there in Acts 2, I mean, you're, you're again, you're breaking the, the covenant with God. Why not make this the day that you and your family seek out the Church of Christ in your community? We encourage you to attend one of our worship times or Bible studies. God's grace, truth, and salvation is truly worth finding and knowing. May God bless and keep you as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you. Our new programs are posted to Facebook and YouTube on Thursday afternoon, and they should be available for viewing by 7 p.m. We also encourage our viewers to visit our website at www.thechurchesofchrist.life. We ask that you like us on Facebook and share our programs. On YouTube please share and subscribe for notifications. This program was pre-recorded.